Okay, my friends, welcome back to Premier Study and Investing. You know, we're going to be looking today at this book called The Search for Modern China. It's very interesting. I just did another book review on a book called China, A Fragile Superpower. That one's a lot shorter and more condensed, so it may be a little bit easier if you want to start there. You'll see the card in the upper right hand corner of the screen in case you want to start there and come back, but up to you. This is a great book. It's just longer and it's more in depth. Um, if you've never studied China before, I had never really studied it like this and I was I was pretty blown away actually. I learned a lot. It was much different than than I thought. You know, I, I don't know what else to really say. This is going to be a, a bit of work. It's going to take a couple different uh, videos to get this done, but I'll give you my best shot. You can do this in a couple ways. You can just listen to, you know, me going over the notes if you want to go on a walk or get on the treadmill or the stationary bike or whatever you could also you know, mute this and just read along maybe increase the speed and just read along um, through the notes as well it's up to you okay so let's jump in the search for a modern china so basically there's some things to look for we had important events in 1644 in 1911 and in 1949 so we're gonna keep our eye on those so there's a romanized chinese that uses like Roman characters or like maybe Latin characters called Finian. And when we go over these words, if we see a C in these characters, we should pronounce it like the TS. So it's, um, and then the Q is pronounced like a CH. So I'll do my best to keep that in mind. If you have trouble with the pronunciation, uh, just you can refer to that in the very beginning. Okay, so late 16th century, so 1500s. The Ming Dynasty seems to be at the height of its glory. The European nations were exploring the globe. But the Ming Dynasty had a problem of tax revenues, troops who were deserting, and the European nations brought extra stress on their trade routes. There was also a drought in the country, and there was poor management. Enter the Manchus from the north, ready to conquer. You have a ruler, uh, Kangzi, who was the emperor. It seemed that even with the transition, the new government was not performing well, and it was also under international eyes. Some wondered if China could actually even be conquered. Well, in 1600, China was by far the largest, the largest country, because Russia wasn't unified at this point. India was very fragmented between the Mongols and the Hindu rulers. Um, the Spanish had introduced infectious disease, and I guess that was causing problems as well. At that time, there were 15 districts in China, and they used a hierarchical system of government. There was also a mix of religious faiths, so Buddhism, Taoism, and Islam. You have an author prior, playwright, Zhang Zhangzhu. In the 1590s, he wrote China's beloved novel called Journey to the West. The main character was a, a monkey with human traits who travels with a monk to India to find Buddhist scriptures. So interesting. So the Golden Lotus was a tale, or perhaps it could be called a fable, about how greed can mess up good opportunities. There was a very prosperous area between the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. And in the far north, it was very, very cold near Mongolia. Children could be indentured on long or short-term contracts. Isn't that really strange? A Macau represents a new kind of problem for China. Macau would buy silk and sell it to the Japanese, and apparently they made a fortune doing this. The Portuguese also brought a lot of silver into China. Now, there was an unsteady flow of silver, making the copper exchange problematic. So you had people hoarding or things like this, right? There was a supply or liquidity problems where you probably couldn't, if you wanted to sell, you couldn't um, get a decent price. You probably had to sell at a loss, something like this, right? Um, there was a war in Manchuria against Nurhaci. There eventually was a breakdown between the rural bureaucracy and as a result, the tax structure also changed. And now there was this guy, Li Zicheng, who went into the army, into the army, but revolted after being uh, treated badly. I said he got screwed. But he had great leadership skills. Eventually he started a new kingdom called Deshan and something about the region of grand obedience. So that had something to do with the Deshan. It says finally, um, it was not the Manchus, but the rebel Li Zichen, who brought down the Ming Dynasty. When they invaded the forbidden city where the emperor lived, the emperor hung himself from a tree inside of the palace. And that was the end of the Ming Dynasty, which lasted about 300 years, from about 1368 
to 1644. So wow, really interesting. Okay, so that was chapter one. Chapter two, the Manchu conquest. The rise of, oh, hold on. What did I say? So Qs are pronounced like CHs. The rise of the Qing, a.k.a. the Manchus, would be the last empire before modern China. It was based out of the Jurchen peoples. The Manchus seized Peking, and it seemed that they would also take control of many areas. Tiny feet, actually, as a cultural note, were a symbol of feminine beauty in the 1930s in China. And there was a big push to segregate the Chinese from the Manchus. As China was very large, it was difficult to patrol. There was also ethnic divisions, and one of the large groups was the Han people. Well, remember that the rise of Li Zicheng would eventually overthrow the Ming Dynasty and that the Ming Emperor would hang himself. While the new rule was the Qing Dynasty. The book says that the lines are blurry when trying to see traditional class structures within the society. So traditional class structures would be like a, a moneyed aristocracy, maybe landed people, maybe people that more were able to live and profit off of their investments rather than getting up and going to work each day. Or traditional class structures could mean, you know, relating to politics. You could say the decision makers versus the rest. I'm not sure what they mean there, but that's what I think of when I think of traditional class structures. So apparently the lines were blurry of control and concentrations of power. It said if you could find a basis, it was due to wealth, education, lineage, and connection to the government. So that's a number of different ways that you could kind of obtain power. Maybe who you know, who you um, are related to, the school that you went to, or the amount of money that you have. Lineage system sometimes called clans. Entry into government was almost exclusively given to the educated as you needed to pass exams, which were written in classical Chinese, which was different from everyday Chinese. Notice the pictures of the emperors with books in the backgrounds, and even a book open before them as they sat. So this was like a sign of prestige, right? This is um, like social signaling. Um, but it's also kind of like the cutting, maybe, uh, I have to think back about the printing press and things like this, but if it was handwritten, it's almost like the most cutting edge technology that you could come up with. Okay, so chapter three. Uh... Zhang Qi's consolidation. So the War of the Three Feudatories from 1673 to 1681. Short, four or five years. No, sorry, eight or nine years. Um, hmm, let's see what this is. So Shun Shi's son, Zhang Zi, who had the problem of unifying China under Manchu control. The last of the Ming officials had already been removed. And so you basically had a situation where you had regional gang leaders, or you can maybe say like gangs based on families. And there were three big ones. The first one, the WU, the Wu, you had the Shang, and you had the Zheng. Zheng. They had almost total power in their respective regions. Remember that the land was wide, it was also varied. Um, it was difficult to patrol, like we said before, and also communication was not easy at this time. So think about the problem of allegiance for those people who had supported the uh, Qing, but lived in an area controlled by the Wu. Yes, who are you going to you know, pay respects to? Probably the local leadership, I'm guessing. The Wu especially also had a lot of troops, and they challenged the Qing rulers, and it seemed that they would be successful for, or at least that China would be divided into like a north and a south. Now... Kang Zi proved to be a great leader, and he eventually overcame the three feudatories and accepted their surrender. Now, Taiwan, let's see. The integration of Taiwan into Chinese history dates from the early 17th century. Okay, so in the 1600s, which is right when we're talking about. During the Ming Dynasty, no one really cared about Taiwan. This was due largely to geographic and weather-related problems. There were European missionaries, apparently, in Taiwan at this point. Now, there was a half-Japanese man named Ko Zinga. It says that he was excellent in naval warfare and that he was a polyglot. He battled the European establishments and the forts, gaining a lot of wealth by defeating the Dutch on one occasion. Eventually, the Qing Dynasty will have economic and trade competition from European countries. 
Eventually, Kozinga was appointed the successor of Shun Zhai. Of those who were loyal to the Ming Dynasty and its emperor, uh, Chong Zhen, many committed suicides when they heard of his death, while others refused to serve the Qing. In the 1600s, there was great power in Confucian ideas. Even though there was an undercurrent of controversy surrounding the true nature of the text, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was any um, dispute or controversy about Confucian texts. This is basically Confucian ideas supported perhaps too strongly the idea of loyalty. So Kozinga leveraged that belief and swayed the people to believe in loyalty to government. At least this was his strategy. Confucius was always testing himself for his virtue to see if he could become better, to rely on education and learning. He wrote that there are known, uh, what uh, he wrote what are known as the five classics, and what they covered was history, poetry, cosmology, divination, and there must have been one more. So history, poetry, cosmology, and divination. I wonder if there was one on like physical, like physics physical sciences, Newtonian physics, something like that, momentum, mass, velocity, these types of things. He and another man also wrote four books. This was the main idea for leading a moral life and the resulting utopia. People who wanted to work in government were tested on these books. Also, the material was flooded with commentaries, reinterpretations, and small modifications by the Buddhist faith, which flourished from the 5th century. For some reason, Europeans seem to be centered in Macau. It says that the Portuguese were given permission from the Qing to make it their base for East Asian trade. The same was not given to the Russians. And Kangxi had been preparing for years to launch an attack on Russia. Very interesting. Now, Taiwan. It was captured by the Qing in 1683. Now, if you didn't already see that other book that I referred to at the beginning of this video called China, A Fragile Superpower, uh, basically, the book spends quite a lot of time talking about a potential war between the United States and China based on some kind of dispute that could occur around either Taiwan or Japan or North Korea. So uh, Taiwan is like very, very, very emotionally important to Chinese people is what that book talked about, that especially the masses. Like it says that the leaders kind of wish that they could give up on the Taiwan issue and just kind of let it go. But if they did so, the people would be so furious. And so there's a big, um, there's a big thing with that. Uh, Taiwan has a elected president, um, like recently, like in the 80s. Yeah, maybe 80s, yeah, was their first elected president, I think. I'll have to go back and check. But my, the point I'm trying to make is that um, he actually issued, like, um, a denouncement of, like, this unification council. So, apparently there's a unification council, which somehow, you know, it's uh, the idea is to have talks about unifying Taiwan with China. And when he said, we're not having that anymore, when he dissolved that, America freaked out. There was a lot of people very upset. And so I just want to bring that in because I think this is going to give us some of the history of why Taiwan is so, I don't know, sentimental or uh, emotional. What is the deal with Taiwan? I mean, why do the Chinese people care so much is kind of the question I'm trying to put forth here. And we'll check it out as we go. So Taiwan was captured by the Qing 1683. Okay, that was a long time ago, long before our grandparents or anything like that. So there was some fighting and there was a treaty that set the border of Russia to the north with China. This border, it's basically the same as it is today. The further the west uh, was disputed, so uh, Kangxi went to the front lines and directed nearly 800,000 troops, who after crossing the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, what they did, they cornered their enemy Galden, who was eventually abandoned by many of his followers. The army also moves west into modern-day Tibet. Now I'll do my best to put up a little map of that. So the Jesuits were excited. As they had been in the Bureau of Astronomy and been given privileges in engineering, they were hoping for a tipping point, a mass conversion of people uh, to Christ, okay. But it was not so easy. As Kang Z stated, that it was a civil right and not part of religion to worship ancestors and to pay homage to Confucius. Uh, there was the famous Jesuit missionary Matteo Ricci, and in the late Min Dynasty, uh, he, he served in the late Min Dynasty. Well, most of the missionaries decided that there was no big problem with this. However, other churchmen from other denominations disagreed profoundly. They believed that Kangxi was essentially claiming uh, paramountcy in matters of church doctrine when telling the Jesuits 
what the Christian converts were allowed to do as quote-unquote civic matters of practice. The change was that the Jesuits were fatally weakening the faith by these compromises. And that's really interesting. So, the Paul Clement the 11th dispatched uh, Pope, I'm sorry. So the Pope So the Pope Clement the 11th dispatched someone to look into the matter. This is on page 71. The man who was sent Maillard de Tournon investigated and strongly agreed with the non Catholic complaints, even to the extent that he said that those who would follow Kangzi's orders would be excommunicated from the church. The emperor responded with the removal of those who refused to sign a certificate accepting Kangzi's position. Though most of the Chinese Jesuits signed, more than 12 missionaries refused to do so and were duly expelled from China. As a result, much of the learning from Galileo that would have been useful on astronomy and science was never received by the Chinese, or at least not during that era. So, he was unable to reform in an organized way and to implement a system of taxation and financial management and financial accuracy. Apparently, he died of natural causes at an old age in despair, and he failed to name an heir to the throne. Chapter 4. Young Zheng's Authority. The brief reign of Emperor Young Zheng, successor to Kang Zi, was important. This was because Kang Zi had not named an heir, as we just talked about, and so, you know, the next leader of the throne was disputed. He had to have his brother arrested, as he believed uh, he resented him. There continue to be problems of taxation in the regions, and also they struggled with developing a proper accounting system. Also some dispute with the Russians over the board, border agreement. So the new ruler, Yang Zheng, introduced a secret system that was kept from some of the government ministries. The reason was in order to collect money in order to fight wars on the northwestern areas between the Gobi Desert and the Himalayan range, and in the north of Tibet called Altai Mountains. The Jesuits made a mistake of insisting on Roman letter systems as it alienated Yang Zheng's father as well as himself. Okay, so they were accustomed of creating fashions within the Chinese society, which was a way that they attempted to unify the people. And there was also big problems with opium addictions. Now, opium is largely grown very much in like Afghanistan today. So it's interesting because we often hear of like the British the Opium Wars, the British maybe bringing that into China. I think that was true because maybe this is going to be later. But definitely, as the British Empire increased and increased, maybe they really had troubles paying for all their operations, all their expansion, all their forts, all their bureaucracy. I wonder, I'm not sure, but it makes sense that maybe they they developed opium markets in China for their trade. Okay, chapter 5. Chinese society in the reign of uh, Cheng Long from 1736 to 1799. Okay, so there were nine macro regions, yet China was far from unified or harmonious. Macro region number one, in Peking. There were a lot of people, there were cash crops, but also deforestation and erosion. There was flooding, population was growing significantly. There were fears that the region economic cities or forces would go to war with each other. Okay. As far as their leadership, there was careful planning that resulted in peaceful transition from Emperor Yong Zheng to his fourth son, Cheng Long, whose most important achievement was the conquest and integration of huge areas of the Western territory. In this way, he doubled the area of China. Wow. Oh. Eventually, it seemed that working for the government was highly sought after. The exams were harder, but even for those that passed, it was often the case that they could get hired. That they could not get hired. Ah, oh, the tests were harder, and even if you passed, you might not get a job. There's a huge task of writing the four treasuries. I'm not sure what the four treasuries are. There was a method called Kao Zheng learning. Okay. China's greatest novel is called The Dream of the Red Chamber also called by its alternate title, The Story of the Stone. Ooh, I like the second one better. The Story of the Stone sounds amazing. Better than The Dream of the Red Chamber. 
Well, what it does, it presents a meticulous description of the Jias, a wealthy Chinese extended family who occupy a series of linked mansions. Now, there are two titles because the dream is ascribed to the Red Chamber, which constitutes an elaborate yes, yet mysterious foretelling of the fates of the main female protagonists who are related or linked to the Jias in some way. And the stone whose story is told is a miraculous artifact, empowered by the gods with a magical life of its own, and living out its existence on the earth through the religious me meditation of a Buddhist and a Taoist priest. At the core of this whole story is a, is a love story. But it's also a question about the identity and the purpose of human life on earth. There are a few sexual limits in this book, where power is used to secure sexual pleasure, but affairs often lead to jealousy, which often lead to murder. In 1977, Ching Long dies, and his son, who wasn't a ruler, commits suicide. Wow, that's actually sad. Well, chapter 6, it says China and the 18th century world. It says China was isolationist in their outlook, in their relationships to other nations, looking down on those that traded or even traveled abroad. The tea trade was very big, as demand was coming from both Europe and the United States. After translating the legal code from the Qing, Lord McCartney, who was related with the East Indian Company, it says it became clear that the understanding of the quote-unquote law was understood differently by the two cultures and that international trade would probably be difficult between uh, the Chinese and Europe. Now, directing the quote-unquote for language at his father, an act that deserved, oh, foul language. Ah, ah, so directing foul language at someone's father, at a person's father, is an act that is actually uh, worthy of death. Very interesting. Since there was a huge trade deficit for Western countries who wanted silk and tea, etc., but Western goods were not really desired by Chinese consumers. Eventually, the British did find something the Chinese would buy, and that is opium. Uh-huh. Opium use has the effect of slowing down and blurring the world around, around one. Of making time stretch and also fade. Of shifting complex or painful realities to an apparently infinite distance. This was quote-unquote useful for people who were bored or under great stress. One criticism of the Chinese was, what they, was that they were not favorable to maritime exploration, maybe because they had such a vast amount of land. Could be. Could be. Okay, now part two is called Fragmentation and Reform. It starts on page 137. Scholars looked at the rights of women, the problem of opium, because they didn't really know if they should ban it or legalize it, which is really interesting. You know, as an American, we just, um, a lot of states are legalizing recreational marijuana. Oregon just recently uh, legalized, I guess for treatment purposes, not for recreation, but um, psilocybin mushrooms. So these are hallucinogens, hallucinogens. So it's like, it's very strange to me. But apparently, you know, the Chinese uh, rulers or ruling class, they didn't really know what to do with opium. And the emperor decided to ban it, actually, which started a war with the Europeans. There was also internal revolts in Nain and Taiping. The one in Taiping was based on fundamentalist Christian principles that cut at the heart of Confucianism and imperial values. Also, we see that the Muslims are revolting. Now, the relationships between Chinese people and Westerners were strained. There was an anti-missionary outbreak, or actually multiple anti-missionary outbreaks, China also lost two small wars with Japan and also with the French. Now, the Boxer Rebellion that we always hear about of the 1900s, where profound anti-Westernism led to widespread attacks on foreign missionaries as well as their converts. Now, the British made a treaty with China, the Treaty of Nanjing, which had 12 articles that would largely change the way China looked at trade and commerce in society. Chapter 8, The Crisis Within, is what Chapter 8 is entitled. Okay, so the British continued to seek treaties that improved their position as a trading nation. Okay, no surprise there. I think that's, that's understandable. Now, it says that there was a guy who tried to assassinate the emperor, and this man, Lin Qing, was a man who traveled and also stated his own religion, started his own religion, excuse me. 
Now later, there was another man named Hong who would acquire Christian evangelistic tracts and come to believe that by a dream that he had, that he was actually the son of God and also the brother of Jesus. Then there was a Taiping army which seized Nanjing, which marked the end of China's self-imposed isolation, wrecked the myth of the Manchu authority, and involved China's once venerated mandarins. Karl Marx was looking at the British involvement in China. Marx knew that the Chinese could not afford both the large imports of opium and the large number of British manufactured goods. Marx believed in four phases of an economy. The Asiatic, ancient, feudal, and then the modern bourgeoisie. Mark writes the critique of political economy, where he wrote, No social order ever perishes before all the productive forces for which there is room in it have developed a new, higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself. No social order ever perishes before all the productive forces for which there is room in it have developed Okay, that's the first condition. And new higher relations of production never appeared before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself. Okay. So I'm going to say that that's something kind of like innovation. What's that quote? Innovation has no... No, no, no. Necessity is the mother of invention. This is the quote, right? So maybe say that you're like an agrarian society and you use uh, plow animals. And then you re reach a certain point where you're, um, you've kind of exhausted the room that you have in that, in that way. I mean, maybe you've gone as west as far as you can or you've used up all the room. Maybe there's like a new tool, the steam engine or something like this, that comes about. And it's kind of born out of necessity. And this is how you develop into like a higher level. But it's kind of born out of the old society. It's born out of need. It's born out of maybe greed. Well, we see that Muslim revolts continue. In chapter 9, you have restoration through reform. In, nine, in, 1859, in 1859, Marx believed that the Qing could not possibly survive, that her downfall was imminent. However, the, Qu the Qing... Three reforms were able to last until 1912. Remember we said that one of those years was really important, 1911. See if we can't figure that out. They used the military to crush rebellions. There was the Tianjin massacre as foreigners, especially missionaries, were hated as they disrupted the Confucian gentry sense of their own worth and authority. Hmm. The missionaries were big on the education and raising the status of women. It was medical missionaries that had the greatest amount of converts in the beginning. Uh, this is on page 208. Westerners thought that the sing-song Chinese language was strange. And Chinese uh, is a tonal language, right? So it matters how you end, you know, in... I mean, in English, right? If we say... Uh, oh, what's a good example? You're going to the store today. This is like a statement, maybe a command, maybe, you know, whatever. You maybe say this to your child who's protesting, right? And you put that intonation on the end. You raise the pitch at the end. It becomes a question. Well, Chinese doesn't work like this exactly. You can't... You're going to say a whole different word if you change the the pitch. The ending, the beginning, the middle. Uh, <laughs> I think there's like four. You know, it's up, down, flat, and, and something else. I'm not sure. But anyways... People thought it was strange. The Chinese immigrants in the U.S. accumulated uh, in the various Chinatowns that could be found in Los Angeles, New York, and Portland. There's definitely a Chinatown in Portland. I've been there. I don't know about the one in Los Angeles. Um, and, of course, there's one in New York. Okay, so chapter 10. New tensions in the late Qing. Well, there's the Japanese War, which is interesting. we got to figure out what, what is this big... Um, you know, what led up to this current kind of like hatred between Chinese and Japanese? Some of it's going to be uh, with some wars. I think the Nanjing Massacre is obviously a very awful title. So maybe that has to do with it. 
It says, Boxers United in Righteousness emerge in the Northwest, focus on secret society and self-defense. There begins to be a mixing or disagreement between the Eastern laws and Western laws. Around 1905, there was a boycott of American goods. Now, it was not like violent like the Boxer Rebellion, but still it would be a persistence for like anti-West or anti-West economic maneuvering. In 1905, the courts decided to get rid of the examination system based on Confucianism. Wow, that's really a big change. China was defeated by Japan in 1894. So 1894, you gotta think, for me it always helps to like put that with something. So 1894, maybe, maybe the first, just a couple years away from maybe like the first automobile, gasoline powered automobile, maybe uh, electricity has been definitely invented and maybe it's starting to spread. I'm not sure if that happened as soon as 1894. That might be a little bit later. But it's like Thomas Edison, those guys at GE fighting over like AC or DC and all that stuff. Anyways, the Chinese were doing a good job building railways. By 1911, ah, 1911, the Qing, the Qing armies, excuse me, mutinies, and things changed very quickly. There was all of a sudden Marxism, and discontent starts leading to many strikes. There was a Republican president and a Manchu emperor. I have a quote here. It says, The final blow to the Qing came at the end of 1912 when 44 senior army commanders sent a telegram to the Peking cabinet urging the formation of a republic in China. So after centuries of emperors, China, with no experience in self-rule or democratic rule, started down the road to a new future. The world wondered what would happen next. Well, part three, it's entitled Envisioning State and Society. It says one of the problems for the Qing was the balance between central power and local power. There was a pivotal president, Wan mm, Shikai, but he lacked military power and organizational skills to pull everything together. Also, many intellectuals were nervous about the uncharted waters. They began to consume large amounts of literature about political thought and theory concerning modern democracies. They called this intellectual output as May 4th thinkers. By 1920, so we've already jumped like 25 years forward. By 1920, there was a strong presence of the Communist Party in China. Wow, okay, so... 1920, I'm thinking, what, like the Roaring Twenties in America, um, 1920, what else? World War One is broke out in 1914, right? Um, okay, so 1920, there's a strong presence of the Communist Party in China. Japan continued to cause China problems by influencing uh, more than just by the military. Hmm, by influence more than by the military. Okay. Now, chapter 12, it's called The New Republic. The national finances were in disarray. There were seven predatory nations interested in China, and China was already in debt to them. Confucianism had also been called into question. There was a lot of violence. They also needed to create a constitution, and they needed to have fair elections. They decided that some men who held property could vote, but no women could vote. Yuan was their currency. Uh, China survived mostly on loans in the beginning. World War I distracted many uh, of China's European competitors or lenders, etc., etc. Now, Japan still has control of Manchuria and requires the 21 demands. I'm not sure what those are, but I bet you, I bet you they were pretty serious. Warlords controlled much of China in reality, causing China to be fragmented. France began bringing the Chinese workers to support their war effort on the manufacturing side of things. The aftermath of the armistice was bad for China, as there were secret deals that gave Japan some added rights to real estate and other things. Now, Sun Yat-sen was unable to create a clear message in terms of his political views. Now we're in chapter 13, which is called A Road is Made, The Warning Voice of Social Darwinism. So the Chinese felt betrayed by the Treaty of Versailles. Social Darwinism led the Chinese to ponder the problems of race. Mao was very upset, upset about the system of arranged marriages. Now, before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in Russia, the Chinese had shown much interest in Marxism. Even though only part of the Communist Manifesto had been translated into Chinese, um, th so they still really had very little exposure to what they were you know, considering getting into. 
Li Dazheo was a man who believed in Marxism and was appointed to the most prestigious university in China. He attracted students, of whom Mao was one, that were convinced about Marxism. Hmm. But their problem was to be able to give it to the public in a convincing way. They basically used the rhetoric of the evils of capital and socialism as their only other choice. So they demonized capitalism and they said, what else can we do? We must go in this other direction. Now the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, the most important new Chinese industry was cigarette manufacturing. Industrialization was away from agriculture. Strikes led those in power to really kind of freak out and become very nervous. We've seen this before. We've seen this in a lot of books. Anytime that there's technological change, those in power are threatened. Uh, anytime there's a big shift in society, in beliefs, those in power are threatened. Um, and we see this all the time. Anytime there's riots, strikes, uprisings, rebellions, people in power are threatened. This usually leads to violence. It's often intimidation and manipulation. Chapter 14, The Clash. There was power with various groups. So you had the Gumindan military was one group. You had the Canton Merchant Corps, which was another. And you had an, a leader named Sun, who just had his own following. There were the th May 30th martyrs. Mm, let's see if I can't put something in the notes about the May 30th martyrs. But Stalin was coaching China on how to implement socialism. And there were some serious missteps, actually, and, and serious failures. Like, they didn't really organize strikes. They didn't know how to basically stop strikes. Um, they didn't really know how to attract non-communist workers. And it says that there was not really like enough propagandizing being done in order to really handle uh, the society, the upset in the people, things of this nature. Okay, by 1927, uh, Chang launches a reign of terror against the wealthiest inhabitants in Shanghai. It says that the farmers were affected by the American stock market crash. So world prices probably went down considerably. So communism also received some blame since it was not able to protect Chinese people from the market boom-bust cycles. People sold their children, they sold their children, their own children, in order to pay some of their debts. Mao was vocal about the problem that women faced under male authority, and he was able to abolish arranged marriages. There's a section on divorce, how divorce was done, uh, page 376, uh, but apparently it was pretty, pretty common. It sounds like Woodrow Wilson wanted the U.S. to enter into the League of Nations, but Congress blocked the entry in 1919 and in 1920. It was clear the West saw Japan as the dominant Asian power. Uh-huh. I think they wanted, I think... Throughout the 1920s, the U.S. foreign policy with China was low-key. The U.S. Congress voted to remit the remaining 12.5 million unpaid boxer indemnity to China. Pearl Buck's Chinese peasants, with their stoic dignity, their endurance, and their innate realism, as well as their ceaseless battles with an unrelenting nature, who reached deepest into American hearts. This book, it sold 1.5 million copies, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. There were swings over time between the First World War. Mao left one wife and then actually married a new woman. But it also was said that his first wife was killed by the Gumindang. With all the talk of communism, the author ponders whether the poor farmer or the commoner cared much about communism at all. However, it must be certain that they thought that life must not need be like this. It's really, really interesting. I guess before we jump into part four, I will pause it. I'll let you guys get a break. We'll come back and finish the rest of the book in a second.